Welcome to Lessons in Leadership, Steve Adubato with my colleague, Mary Gamba. We are having absolutely, categorically, <laughs> day after Super Bowl, to be seen later, too much fun. Mary, are. Um, why do we have so much fun on a taping day? I don't know, but it's so funny. I, my cheeks at the end of a taping day, like, uh, and women, I think, know this even more than men. On your wedding day, all you're doing is you're posing for pictures, and your your face hurts. And right now, it's mid afternoon, and my face hurts from smiling so much. But it means we're doing something good. It means that we're having a good time, and hopefully, our audience is also having a good time that's tuned in. And we're gonna, Mary, you're gonna welcome. Excuse me, say thank you to all of our funders in just a second. But it is my honor and pleasure speaking about having fun. Micheline Davis is just not just a great friend, but trust me, we laugh a lot off camera as well. Micheline Davis is president and CEO of National Medical Fellowships. Good to see you, my friend. It is great to see you. It is great to see you. And Micheline is also a board of trustee member at the Caucus Educational Corporation, our not-for-profit production company. Uh, Mary, before we get into this with Micheline, talking about all range of whole range of leadership ish communication issues. Can we thank the folks who No Money, No Mission make this show possible? We would love to. So uh, we have a great list of uh, sponsors who make the show possible. Prager Metis, Valley Bank, New Jersey Sharing Network, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, Seton Hall University, and the Bacino Leadership Institute, the North Ward Center, Kessler Foundation, and Delta Dental of New Jersey. So thank you all, because without your support, we would not be able to have as much fun and bring all these leadership lessons to our audience. So thank you so much. And the fundraising never stops. So uh, Micheline Davis, how are we doing? We are doing super well, my friend. We're doing really well, despite the fact of being still in this continuous pandemic. We are uh, changing the world and, and changing lives. So doing really well. How are you? Um, we're doing great, Micheline. We're going to put up the, fa the fellowship uh, information, the organization's information Please describe it so that people understand the incredibly important work that you and your colleagues are doing. Thank you. So National Medical Fellowships is actually one of the first diversity organizations in the continental United States of America. And we have for the last 75 years been picking up the big boulder of health equity and moving it forward by ensuring financial support and community support to black, indigenous, persons of color uh, who are underrepresented in medicine in order to ensure a much more diverse workforce. Connect that work to the kind of, quote, real leadership that is required and needed, particularly in the world of healthcare, with the in extraordinary inequities that have been going on too long, but have been exacerbated and laid to bear in the last two plus years. Steve, I, I have to tell you, you know, um, those of us in health equity, uh, this pandemic merely magnified, right? It was a great magnifier of uh, the impact and effect of structural inequities within our communities. The work that, that uh, National Medical Fellowship does is so all important in order to finally address these issues. We have known that they were there, but in order to have the willingness and then the forthright thought around strategically, how do we actually address these issues? How do we get to a point where we actually have achieved equity for all? One of the things that we realize and have noticed is the fact that studies after study has really revealed that the more that there are individuals who look like the patients they serve, the better are those health outcomes. So we have seen that black babies live longer when they have black doctors, that Latina mothers live longer when they are literally treated by uh, Latina doctors. And so we've seen this across the board. We know this to be true. And, and literally National Medical Fellowships helps to ensure that we finally eliminate those disparities. That's leadership. Mary Gamma, pick it up. Sure. Micheline, um, obviously at this point, we're two plus years into a pandemic and there's so much adversity uh, that we are all facing. Can you talk a little bit about the grit, the perseverance? I feel Steve and I are using this word grit so much, but I really don't feel like it can be overused. Talk about that specifically, how it ties to uh, National Medical Fellowships and the racial equity uh, gap in healthcare. Um, talk about the importance of grit and perseverance. Oh, I love that you asked that question. Again, this magnifies the fact that the both of you understand the nuance of leadership, right? Um, and, and as we take a look at um, really where we are at this current juncture, um, it, it, it permits me an opportunity to say, let's take a look back. 
look back at when this pandemic first hit American shores, right? What we saw was the fact that the healthcare industry was um, uh, not where it, it needed to be in order to literally weather this impact. So we had individuals who were treating those communities that were made most vulnerable as a result of uh, systemic and, and structural racism and inequities have to treat those community members who were that much more compromised, right? Having to treat those individuals without the necessary PPE, without the requisite equipment, and having to do it in incredible numbers. So, so why do I mention that when we talk about grit? Well, because to me, grit is something that is slightly more than resilience, right? We have all had to learn to become slightly resilient during this time, but grit is that, that additional uh, X factor that ensures that you show up understanding that yes, I am going up against a Goliath of which we do not know the economic or, or health proportions thereof, but I'm going to do it anyway. And then after treating everyone that we will have to treat on today, I will show up again on tomorrow. Understanding that I don't even understand the fullness of the impact that this could have on me and my family on me and my colleagues, on me and my community, but I'm gonna do it anyway. So when we talk about grit and the importance of that, it causes me to look at the fact that NMF alums are more likely than their mainstream counterparts to return to communities that have been made vulnerable as a result of strategic and structural systemic uh, uh, inequity in order to treat those populations that are A, more vulnerable, right, and B, those who were the essential workers that made it possible for the rest of us to stay home and shelter in place, right? So when we talk about the grit that's required, that's our entire population of 32,000 alumni. And you know, they showed up with grit over and over again. I'm sorry for interrupting, Ms. Lane. Um, because you and I have known each other for a long time, we've been friends and colleagues and uh, formerly at RWJ Barnabas Health, now in this extraordinarily important role at National Mental medical fellowships, because I know just a little bit about your person, who you are at the core. And we've had lots of, let's call them uh, difficult conversations. So there, there's, there's a question here, trust me. You talked about the grit of the physicians, right? Of the healthcare professionals tied to the, your organization. But there's always, there's something else here. Your grit, your grit to, have dealt with to deal with, and I'm not going to go into your personal life, that's for you to talk about or not, that's your choice. But only from a distance as your friend and colleague, I know just a tiny bit of the adversity and challenges you have faced. Where does your grit come from? Steve, because you are someone who I consider a friend, I think that you already know the answer to that question. You are practicing law without a license. Um, as lawyers, we are taught to never ask questions to which we do not know the answers. And you know that uh, I firmly feel and deeply believe that my grit comes from two primary places, but it's really all connected into one. And that is that I had phenomenal, outrageously wondrous parents, right? I grew up with uh, in a home that was extremely love wealthy despite being economically deprived and that the greatest gift that my parents ever gave to me was a deep faith and grounding. So I've always said, as people have oftentimes called me confident, that I am not confident. I have Godfidence. My confidence is in another. I believe in an, a providence that comes from on high. And so you are correct. I have had, yes, a, a great deal of adversity and I've had to deal with some of the things that now, right now, many of my colleagues who are who are out there on the front lines of advancing uh, health equity um, are beginning to see and feel over and over again up at Brigham and Women's Hospital. They were recently protested by a group of, of neo-Nazis, right? My, my dear uh, uh, alumni of NMF, Dr. Aletha Maybank, who was the first chief health equity officer at AMA, who published a language guide around having an anti-racist healthcare system while she has also endured some of the threats that I have had to endure. And this is what I will say to you, my friend, that grit comes from that which John Lewis once said, if you, if you see something, right, if you, you, you know that you've got to actually do something about it, that we are called in order to get into good trouble, necessary trouble. And so those to whom I pledge allegiance 
healthier communities, communities that have been made uh, vulnerable, a higher authority. Well, I am called to have to walk through the valley of the shadow without a fear because I know that I am not alone. I know that there is a higher hand that is guiding me and protecting just as those who are picking up alms in order to make certain that they understand that historically there's been an equity created that we want to now deconstruct and create a more equitable society for all. And so my friend, you know that I have had to reach out to friends like you in order to encourage my heart from time to time. But I will tell you that it's been, wor that it's been worth it every day. Uh, it's mutual. But the other thing is I want to, uh, Micheline gives credit to a lot of other people and she talks about the inspiration she uh, received from the late great extraordinary leader, uh, John Lewis. Uh, for those of you who don't, you hear John Lewis's name, you think you know, you, you may not know. Search John Lewis, who was right there, shoulder to shoulder with Dr. King, walking across the Pettus Bridge. Search and look at the video of John Lewis at 21 years of age, beaten to within an inch of his life by law enforcement professionals. The word professional is used loosely here um, with Billy Clubs. Beat him, smashed his head. And leadership, putting your life on the line right there with Dr. King uh, is what Micheline is talking about. And faith is, is, you said it so well. Mary, I'm sorry for getting so deep. I, I, you know, it's supposed to, it le Mary, should the, the program actually be called Lessons in Life and not Lessons in Leadership? <laughs> I, I often, as I'm listening and just Micheline, you know, I mean, you have just inspired me with your passion and your level of caring. So I thank you not only for bringing that to us, but also bringing it to our viewers. So no, Steve, you're not getting too deep. And it's just such a wonderful opportunity to just continue to get these messages out there. Micheline, before I let you go, let me ask you this. The connection between the work you are doing with these um, very special professionals in the medical field, uh, physicians, particularly physicians of color, promoting uh, health equity that, you, that you're talking about, where is the place for the kind of developing or the development of people, those professionals? And this is not a leading question because obviously, you know, that's the work Mary and I do, but it, it's real your role in helping those professionals be the best leaders and communicators they can be. Please talk about that before we let you go. Steve, I think you know how I feel about talent development, right? And capacity building for individuals. I think that so often we have individuals who work within our, our teams um, that quite frankly, they give so much of themselves. When you work at a place, you give um, time, talent, um, uh, and, and when you are affiliated with an entity, you know, you give them the same. It is our duty in order to make certain that we are giving them an opportunity to hone skills and mature and develop. But in order to do that, you've got to be conscientious. I believe that true leadership, right, demands that we give back opportunities in order to hone these individuals so that they not just become healthcare professionals of the future, but that they become healthcare leaders of the future. We've heard a lot about systems change. Well, my friends, who's going to lead these new systems if we do not plant those seeds today? So I look forward to making certain that we do exactly that. And you know, I've already picked up the phone to call you to say, hey, Steve, come along and help me do exactly that. We're partners and friends for life and uh, maybe beyond. Hey, listen, Micheline Davis, who is president and CEO of National Medical Fellowships and also a very trusted trustee of the Caucus Educational Corporation, our sister organization on the not-for-profit side. Thank you, Micheline. Thank you. Thank you both. Thank you, Mary. Thank you, Micheline. I'm Steve. That's Mary. That's Micheline. We'll be right back. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University. Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Welcome back to Lessons in Leadership. Steve Adubato, Mary Gamba. Ironically, we're taping this on Valentine's Day, 2020, 
to be seen after that. Mary, did we, we did not discuss again, the red ties. I'm realizing it's Valentine's Day. It's perfect, right? Mm -hmm. It is. And it's funny. I never wear red and I just saw this top and I said, oh, I think that would look nice with a blue background. So the, the challenge for me is I often wear a lot of blues and I have to be very careful so it doesn't uh, blend myself right into the background. So wow, important talk stuff. About really important stuff we're covering. Um, <laughs> in all seriousness, biggest takeaway from before we introduce the president of Rutgers University, Dr. Holloway, uh, could you just your biggest takeaway from listening to our great friend and partner and colleague, Micheline yeah. Davis? I just want to have one tenth of her dedication, her passion, her enthusiasm, and it's just contagious. You can just listen to Micheline. I always joke, you can listen to her just, you know, recite a phone book and, and just be right in and engaged. And it goes to leadership and the overall ability to engage your audience. And if you're passionate about something, it's going to come through. And she obviously is passionate about the path that she's going on life, in life and just helping others. So it's always just so great when we have the opportunity to have her join us. And you know, the other thing that strikes me is when I asked Micheline, and again, uh, if you wanna find out about Micheline, you should search her. Our career is, is unreal. It is just, oh, yeah. she's accomplished so much at such a young age, but has also faced tremendous adversity and you won't find that in what you Google sometimes. But when I asked her about grit, she talked about her faith, but she also talked about her parents. And you're a product uh, of your dad and your late mom. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm a product of my late dad and <clears throat> my mom. But do you, I'm trying not to make too much of this. How much of who we are as people do you believe is either dictated or greatly influenced by our parents? Oh, I think it's a huge for better or for worse. You know, uh, my husband and I will often joke and be like, all right, where did we fail uh, when the kids are either acting up or doing something inappropriate? And it is. It, I think that the nature versus nurture, I would say it's probably about 80 20. I think 80% of who we are. And again, it's not always just the good, it's, you know, the bad, the quirky, the, the dealing with adversity when it happens. And then the other part is the experiences that we've learned. I've learned and grown so much from you. And I've thanked you for that over the years, just in my overall confidence communicating. So I do feel that there's a tremendous, it's who you spend such a large part of your time with uh, is your family unit. So, and it's also, and I'm glad that I said family because it's also not just your parents, but it's your siblings, it's your friends, it's who you surround yourself with. So make good choices there as well. Yeah. And again, as we listen to the president of Rutgers University, Dr. Jonathan Holloway, one of the themes you'll pick up here is he talked about the importance of leaders, quote unquote, staying calm in a crisis two years plus into this pandemic. Mary and I are going to talk about the importance of staying calm after you listen uh, to Dr. Holloway talking about his view of leadership, Dr. Jonathan Holloway. Dr. Jonathan Holloway, president of Rutgers University, I'm curious about this. Um, Coming into Rutgers in January 2020, pandemic hits six weeks later. The number one leadership lesson you have learned in the last two years, two years plus is? Last two years, it has been profoundly fluid in thinking of the, the virus, um, issues of racial disparity in this country, uh, wealth inequity. All of these things are really heightened in a way that I've not experienced in my lifetime. And if you looked at my inbox, believe me, everybody is freaked out. Every single person is. And so in this moment, staying calm is an incredible asset. I mean, it allows other people to start to take a breath, reflect on the situation, and frankly, make the best decision that one can make in the moment. So I'm not going to rush from one thing to another because that is when I will make errors. I think a lot of people will make errors. Uh, real quick, uh, your staying calm comes from where? Because for some of us who grew up in families that, let's just say, were not especially calm, especially around the dinner table, uh, I'm always struck by people who are calm. And I wonder if it's in the genes, if it's trained. Where, where did you get that? You know, I've never really thought about that much. If I had a, my, my first reaction is in the way in which I was raised. My mother, my late mother was a kindergarten teacher. And she, and she was quiet, calm, and steady and uh, had a profound impact on my life and my weight and my, on, on how I approach situations. And so I think, look, that when I think about being calm, it comes with other attributes, which mean, which involve being willing and, and uh, taking the time to listen to other people, being willing to share resources with other people. I mean, look, these are things you learn in kindergarten, frankly, should learn in kindergarten. 
So I think I learned a lot of this stuff from my mother and temperamentally, gosh, I, I don't know. This is, this is just how I am. I, I don't have a fancy answer beyond that. Um, who Staying I calm. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm going to have to remember that. And everybody who watches Lessons in Leadership will remember that as well, especially when things around us are so uncertain and we think we have a game plan and then all of a sudden the world changes around us. Freaking out. I've, as I found, I, saying it is one thing, doing it is another. Freaking out is actually not a strategy. It's just an emotion. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dr. Holloway, thank you so much. Best to you and everyone at Rutgers. Thank you so much. That was Dr. Jonathan Holloway, the president of Rutgers University. Mary, did you pick up that Dr. Holloway said his demeanor came from his late mother, who was a kindergarten teacher. She was calm and she had a profound impact on him. So again, I don't want to make too much of this, but we're, it's, it, right now in real time, Alvin told me not to have my phone next to me. It's right about one o'clock in the afternoon as we're taping all day. Real quick, and everything's taped out of order. Describe the first half hour of our day. <laughs> well, as we always do, we start off and we're all energetic and positive and get started. And the first guest, anything could go wrong. First guest, there was some humming on the computer and we gave it a few minutes. I tried to keep in contact with you and let you know what was happening. So we're like, okay, no problem. We'll try to do that another time go into our second guest and the speakers weren't working. And at that point I was this close to just saying, all right guys, let's just cancel the whole day. <laughs> if this is the way the day is gonna go. Uh, we don't have that luxury in life and it's about staying calm. And I love that Dr. Uh, Holloway had given that a great example of the kindergarten teacher because there is nothing more chaotic than I just go back to when my kids were in kindergarten and you're teaching kids how to uh, listen and how to sit still and while also trying to teach them valuable life skills. So that is no better example than just trying to stay calm. And I must have taken about 15 deep breaths. I was hoping not to hyperventilate because that's all you can do when things go wrong, but then also quickly pivot. And I feel like we did that very well. And here we are uh, many shows in and thankfully things are looking good, but I hope I don't, I didn't just jinx it. Well, listen, whatever happens, happens. You know, it's so interesting. Uh, and also to quote the great uh, Dr. Richard Carlson, Mary. Don't sweat the small stuff. Exactly. So we have this, Mary and I have these list of quotes that we always send each other. And then we get through 1% of them because we're always talking about a million other things. But I always, I Google all the time, the greatest leadership quotes. 90% of these people, I don't know who they are, but this one comes from, is it Lori D-E-S-C-H-E-N-E? -E? I think it's, I don't know how to say her last name. It doesn't matter. You say it. About, <laughs> I'm not trying, I'm not, you ever notice with the hard names, I have Mary introduce them. So are you ready for this? This comes from Lori D. Just breathe. No matter what happens, you can handle it and you're going to be okay. Uh, easier said than done, obviously. But one of the things that, that I've learned, and again, I, I, I'll stay off my soapbox. I know for years that uh, I learned, my dad was incredibly, he was a great leader. And in a crisis, he was very calm back in 19, early mid 1970s. And I wrote about this in, in this new book that Mary and I have been working on. Um, follow up to lessons in leadership. I wrote a chapter on my dad. He created an organization called the North Ward Center, which my sister Michelle is the executive director, the CEO of. <clears throat> and uh, the building burned down mid 70s, um, day after Christmas, freezing cold. I watched my dad while people gathered in Newark in the neighborhood we were from. The building that he, the organization he had created, was burning to the ground. And I watched him and people were crying around him and hysterical because you could see what was happening to the building. And my father calmly got everyone together, freezing cold outside, middle of the night. I ever tell you this, Mary? Mm -hmm, you um, did. He said, uh, all right, you can cry all you want. Do what you have to do. Grieve. Tomorrow morning, tomorrow morning we're meeting at eight o'clock and we're going to figure out a game plan and they put a tarp on the building and then we did the rest to secure the building and have different shifts, blah, 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 blah. Why am I saying that? Because hey, I saw my, my father calm in a crisis, but I also saw my father when smaller things went wrong, it wasn't pretty. And heads would roll and blame would get thrown around and it wasn't as great as quality as a leader. I learned that. I was that for many years. I still, it rears its head sometimes. You don't. So that 
background from our parents, Mary, trust me, there's a point here. It doesn't dictate who and what will be good, bad, and different. It influences it. But if we decide we're going to make a change and we're going to do something differently and commit to it, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, well, one of the books, and we're talking about expanding on our leadership library, and I, 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 I'm going to admit this, and I don't know how you're going to feel about it because we haven't talked about Anthony Robbins here on the show, uh, but I was listening to an audio book of the great Tony Robbins, and he was talking about making a decision and how not making a decision, in, in fact, is making a decision to not make a decision. And it just really made me think of the story you just shared about your dad. He made a decision in that moment of how am I going to lead? He consciously decided, sure, I'm sure he wanted just to throw his hands up in the air, bury his head in the sand, feel sorry for himself, say, why me? But he saw the people around him and what they needed. And he made a decision to let them know we're going to be okay. And that's, you and I have talked about that a million times when things go, go awry this morning, I, we collectively made a decision to make the best of it and then make a decision of how we're going to handle it. And it's all about pivoting. It's all about being agile. And we talk about it, but we can't talk about it enough. And to Mary's point, technical problems, things, that's one thing. I don't know why this kicks in. And trust me, when I talk about things I, that I do well as a leader, it, people can assume that, oh, look at Steve bragging about himself. If you read this book and the new book, um, which we haven't figured out a title for yet, 90% of the book, a big part of the book is me admitting mistakes. But I, when we lost one of our most when we lost a, several people, but particularly Laura Van Bloom, who was our head of marketing, and then Linda Toro comes in as the new head of marketing. I don't know why, but I remember thinking as I watched you, the rock of the organization, start to feel it. I don't ask me why I decided, as Laura was telling me, she's extraordinary. She's great going over to Evie's Village, doing a great job. Somehow, I think my father's spirit kicked in because it's like, look, you can be angry, which I wasn't. You could be scared, which I was afraid. You could be panicky, which doesn't help. Point being, Mary, I pivoted faster than you did. I noticed that in that one, because I was like, okay, this is terrible, it sucks. What do we have to do? And I was in that other mode. It was a different gear. Is that making a different yeah. leadership gear? Oh, totally, and you were yeah. a little behind me. Usually I'm following you. Yep, <laughs> but that's what's so great. And you talk about the yin and the yang and you and I are always there for each other, picking each other up and, and just helping if you do kind of lose your way a little bit and thank you for that and being the anchor there because you do, you start to question a lot of things and, and it just goes back to being there for one another. So thank you for that. And, 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 and trust me, it's the other way around. <laughs> Mary's like- The majority listen. of the time I'm usually the rock. But Listen, I needed Mary, that. So. Mary's basically saying, cool your jets. Yeah, exactly. Just, just relax, will you? You're making the situation worse. Mm -hmm. Just And again, it, it's all about perspective. And speaking of perspective, I do not want to let this show end without us thanking our promotional partners. Because I said on. I was going to do 30 that seconds, today. go. I know, I do. So uh, Commerce Magazine and CINJ are great friends over there and NJBIA and New Jersey Business Magazine. So thank you so much. And if you also want to find out more about us and Steve's book and our future books that we're collaborating on, stand-deliver.com. So just had to get that in there. Thank you, Mary. Elvin, I see you telling us to say goodbye. Goodbye, Mary. Goodbye, Steve. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. That's it. She said it. See you next time. This edition of Lessons in Leadership is made possible by the Bucino Leadership Institute at Seton Hall University, Prager Metis, Valley Bank, the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 825, the North Ward Center, the New Jersey Sharing Network, Delta Dental of New Jersey, Kessler Foundation, and Seton Hall University, showing the world what great minds can do since 1856. This is Mary Gamba. If you want more leadership tips and tools, log on to stand-deliver.com. That's stand-deliver.com. Promotional support for this edition of Lessons in Leadership with me, Steve Adubato, and my colleague, Mary Gamba, has been provided by NJ.com, NJBIA, and New Jersey Business Magazine, CIANJ, and Commerce Magazine. Valley's all about making life easier for clients. And that's why we're all about smiles, too. 
so every day we make it possible for home buyers to become homeowners. For folks chasing their dreams to become entrepreneurs, for parents to plan today for their children's tomorrow, and for communities to get better every day. You see, when we know we've put a smile on a customer's face, well, that puts one on ours too.